Hi, welcome to the first edition of the conference Pule Brasil. Antes de começar, gostaríamos de lembrar ao nosso público que o painel com áudio ao vivo em português está disponível em nosso canal no YouTube. My name is Vivian Kawanami. I am a master in human rights and humanitarian action from Sciences Po Paris and co-founder and co-president of the Conference Pule Brasil. On behalf of the organizing team, I would like to thank you for being here with us for our panel on structural racism. This conference is organized by Sciences Po Paris students and alumni, and its central theme is overcoming inequalities. 10 years for the sustainable development goals. There will be 13 panels and more than 50 speakers distributed over seven weeks. In addition to the relentless voluntary work of our team, we thank our partners. Chidisetubo Foundation, Sciences Po Political Observatory for Latin America and the Caribbean, Educa Libras and Headline for allowing us to create an online event free of charge and with simultaneous interpreting into English, Portuguese and Brazilian Sign Language. Before we start today's panel, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to join us for our next meeting on December 1st, Tuesday at 3 p.m. Brazil time, in which we will debate the black activism with Kelly Batista, his general Fundação Umbi, Erica Malunguinho, a state representative affiliated to the political party PSOL, representing Sao Paulo, the Modi artist and founder of Casa Poema Elisa Lucinda and global director of Centra Unica das Favelas, Preto Zé, with the moderation of Isabella Hayes, journalist and podcaster. I would like to thank all panelists and moderators who voluntarily participate in the debate and made this event possible. And now I give the floor to Barbara Pais, who will introduce the theme of today's panel and our guests. Thank you. Hi, Vivian. Thank you very much for opening this panel. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, for the invitation for being here, for this opportunity of gathering together, although it's virtually, for this brilliant panel I'm going to present to you today. It's a conference on obstacles our country is facing concerning e inequalities. It's hard to find inequality, fight inequalities if you don't include racism in the context. When we are look at this, we are looking at structures that were brought to our lives from the past and are still impacting our lives today, impacting it in a very structural fashion and affecting our economic cycles and uh, that's until today. This year, 2020, the, the existing racism is now open and made clear. We had a number of cases with black people who were, attacked and we've seen this in the last few weeks and this has always been a also been a year in which in the world many uh activist movements have been uh in evidence and this has been affecting the population uh, that is black and poor in brazil and they are usually facing problems with a, a lack of dignity or a lack of work this structural race racism is not something we can forget. It's of utmost importance to dis discuss this theme, 
towards equality. I can't wait to hear the panelists. We are here today with Jurema Vernek, the executive director at Amnesty International. She's an activist, she's the doctor, she's the author and a PhD in communication and culture by the Federal University of Rio. She tells a, lo a, a very long story uh, in, with involvement in human rights. She is the founder of the NGO Creola. And since 1992, she's been working to guarantee black women's rights in the country. Uh, she took over in 2007 as a director of Amnesty International Brazil Executive Board, which is one of the largest and most important human rights organizations in the world. We also have Thiago Amparo, he is the diversity coordinator of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. He teaches at FGV Law School and she also, he also teaches at the International Relations course in the same university. He is a master and PhD of law from Central European University. And we also have, uh, he, is, he was also a professor at the University of Columbia in New York, and he writes to Folha de São Paulo newspaper every Monday. We also have Gabriel Sampaio. He is the program coordinator at Connectus Human Rights. He is a lawyer. He's a master on social relations by PUC in Sao Paulo. He's a member of the Brazilian Constitutional Studies. He, he was a lecturer uh, at UNICEOB. He was also the Secretary of the Legislative Affair of the Ministry of Justice and Counselor of the National Council on Criminal and Penitentiary Policy. So I'd like to start by asking a question to Tiago. On November 20th, we all woke up with the shocking news of the murder of João Alberto Silveira Freitas, a 40-year-old black man who was beaten up to death on Thursday evening by two security guards at a unit of Carrefour supermarket in Porto Alegre. At the time, the sheriff of the case, in charge of the case said that there was no evidence of racism to date on so far. Commenting on this, you said this speech was an example of the normalization of the death of black people, and that death is also caused by the pain of those who have the power to provide justice and do not do it. Today in the country, we have a scenario in which on the one hand, we have authorities who deny the existence of racism. And on the other hand, we have institutions and companies like Carrefour that claim to recognize racism, but that only issues notes of regrets and rejection. But what to do, but that to take the real, they do not take measures for change. In a country where a young black man dies every 23 minutes, is this is very serious. You can talk a little bit about how we got to this state of normalization in Brazil and the effects in our society. Yes. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here with you, with, with Gabriel and Jurema. First of all, I would like to start by describing myself. Those who do not see, I am a brown man. I am wearing a round frame of glasses. I have a colorful shelf of books and I'm wearing a black shirt. Barbara, when I wrote that text, I thought that about not only of the violence that we look at and witness that was caused by the, end of, by the hands of two men, like at what happened at Carrefour and what we see uh, through the hands of the police towards the black people. I also intended to think of the justice system, that the political systems and how it reproduces racism and allows racism to occur. The police in Brazil kills at alarming rates in Brazil. And Brazil kills around 80% of black people among all the, all the victims. And according to the law, they, and from the moral perspective and the legal perspective and humanitarian perspective and public security perspective, they cannot do it. But in practical terms, they do it because there's no concrete uh, action after these deaths occur and the police uh, 
themselves will investigate the death they've caused. And this is what is happening in a recurrent, on a recurrent basis. And this is allowed with uh, the pen of those who sign on behalf of the justice uh, sphere. Racism is reproduced and perpetuates through the normalization and the common uh, look towards what causes this death to be reproduced. And this is not an accident. This is not something that should not call our attention. This is the project itself, the political project of exercising the power through death. It's the necropolitics. It's not only about killing people, it's about building up a system in which people are close uh, to death. They are, uh, death permeates their lives. And this is not an accident. This is a political project. And, and this is about the maintenance of the status quo and uh, the violence towards the black bodies. We have to understand the structural racism is not an accident. It's part of the structure of the society. And we have the possibility of changing this structure so that we can move races from one place to some other. And we need to understand the structure itself, the police, pol the police structure. It was thought of and created in the 19th century to safeguard property and to capture uh, escaping slaves, and this is not an accident. And of course, the police is going to reproduce this sort of discourse and this sort of violence because this is how the police in Brazil was created and, and the work was built up. We need to deconstruct the function of the police and how they work on a daily basis. And I think that when we talk about structural racism, and using my five to three minutes I have left, when we talk about the structural racism, we need to talk about racial relationships. We need to understand that the, this is not a problem of the black people. It is a system that is put in place to diminish the black people. And remember being in a conversation one day uh, with a friend of mine, a lawyer, a white lawyer, he said, well, I found out and I've opened up my eyes to race him. He's around 50 years old. And he said, I understood and I've opened my eyes right after I read Lazaro Ramos's book. And then I said, if you are 50, and you only thought of racism just racism now after this book, this means this is the, the greatest proof of racism. People are turned into something invisible because they don't see their race as a race. They don't see the racism. Uh, they don't see their participation. We need to talk about the racial relationships and how it perpetuates the power. Sometimes the way we fight structural racism is, for example, well, we need to help and improve conditions for them. They are not capable enough. They're not trained. They are underdeveloped. We need to have a, a better country and with more equality. Uh, for example, there is a book called How to Be Anti-Racist. Racist. It brings an idea that we need to bring the savage people to civilization. Being anti-racist is not that. It means to recognize we have that the black people are not different uh, in capacity and ability and intellectual uh, ability and, and social status from the white people. And if there is any difference there concerning this in society, we need to, to make, change people's minds. We understand that having the 80% of all the, the 
victims from the policies being black, police being black, we need to change that. For example, in Porto Alegre, with that death in the supermarket, we understand this is not an accident. It happened in uh, in a store. You see that the black people they 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 transit in open spaces, whether it's a public space, they transit as an incomplete citizen. And within a private space, we are an incomplete consumers. Those who are suspects, maybe they are stealing something. We need to deconstruct this structure. And we have to start participating in this, this deconstruction. Whether we are white or black, we need to understand that the social relationships and the distribution of in unequal power is what we have to consider. Maybe I've spoken for about seven minutes. It was a great speech in this focus you brought to the debate on how this is not an accident leads me to a question I want to ask Gabriel. You talk a lot about how the police was thought of to, for a political uh, project, and that's not an accident that we are in the situation. You mentioned that any democratic society has to be have control over the use of force. For a democracy to be consolidated, we cannot uh, be conniving with this kind of behavior. And But the strength in Brazil is based and supported by a uh, public security structure uh, that is thought of uh, and victim, uh, the black young people are the main focus of violence. And I would like to you to talk uh, to us a little bit of how the Brazilian government has been using violence against the peripheral and black population and how we can uh, provide a systematic change in this model of public security and strengthen our democracy. What are the paths? Your mic is off. First of all, good morning to everybody. As Thiago says, said, I'm a black man using uh, black uh, rim glasses. I'm on the room in my house with very light area and white walls. First, I want to dedicate this speech to João Alberto, his family, and that of all black people who are victim of violence imposed here in our country. I want to say, Barbara, also to you and about your question. First, uh, digressing a little bit. When you talk about structural racism in Brazil, we need to understand how it is a chapter of uh, world history, how structural racism in our society is part of a, a process of power of uh, economic structuring of power with a concept of race that imposed this sub, uh, subdivision for putting the, the black races uh, race, uh, as uh, inferior. The European nations to support their Illuminist discourse that uh, talks about uh, universality of right, racism, equality, fraternity, faced crossroads. How could they support an universal discourse in face of colonial, uh, colonies, of the slaving of uh, people coming from Africa? That was made possible by building a racism model, a concept of race that in could ensure their economic power and the set of wealth that also determines the inequality between countries today. So the challenge of facing structural racism in Brazil is the challenge of all the, the activists that defend human rights for a more equal and uh, so society all over the world. Transforming the structures of society is a task that for all of those who believe in a more fair 
and equalitarian society. And in this aspect, uh, one of the consequences of structural racism, as uh, Tiago mentioned, has a lot to do with racial relationships. It has to do with power relationships and of the termination of, over life and death, as uh, Kilimembe says when uh, talking about necropolitics. And this sets a role for institutions. This is present in no part of our moments of our history. I'd like to refer to history a lot. When Brazil was under the pressures to end the slavery uh, process since the Haitian revolution that challenged the French model after the French revolution and that afterwards was challenged by the restrictions promoted in terms of international legislation against uh, slavery. Here in Brazil, we developed the technology to support this slavery model. When they had inspections in the slave uh, ships that brought uh, slaves to Brazil, Brazil was the one that brought more slaves in the world. Uh, the slaves were thrown out to the sea with stones tied onto their necks so there were no uh, evidences of this slave traffic. Brazil, uh, due to all the internal pressures by Palmares and all in all the Quilombos in the country that made uh, unsustainable the slavery system, uh, from a justice uh, point of view, they started developing this uh, slave model with legislation stopping the traffic and other uh, legislation. But at the same time, uh, they uh, surrendered in terms of legislation. They uh, passed the law of uh, lands, sustaining a criminal legislation to contain and criminalize all kind of uh, black resistance. So institutions served a project that has, and the racist formation, it's the support, the base for all the model of power. This history is present today. The challenge that experienced by the black slave people in Haiti to question, to challenge the French regarding their uh, universal ideas is a challenge for all Brazilians and all global citizens. And we have to demand from the institutions, as you ask me, measures that uh, to face racism, the structural racism. We cannot accept, and every time I talk about it, uh, I have a hard time uh, keeping my tone uh, calm but it's unacceptable for a democratic country as Brazil claims to be without the construction that supports the rule of law, the uh, guarantee of fundamental rights and separation of uh, powers will produce uh, death, violent death rates that affect 75% uh, black population. The deaths called by the state forces are 80% of the times against the black population. We cannot accept to say that we are live in a democratic society in face of this data without prioritizing all uh, for the public agents the challenging and facing of this reality. This is data that has been around for a long time. It's not from today. And it's found in researches published for a while, long time. And what's the priority of today's uh, government agencies? We have norms that have been written to uh, cut the regulations on over the use of guns. Most violence comes from uh, the use of guns. And what's in the rationale now the, uh, bef behind for, for a government agent 
when uh, they allow uh, the freer use of gun they don't have no they have no respect for the life of people same thing goes for the public forces it's elementary for democracy that the force the use of force by the government is controlled we don't need to digress that much to Montesquieu to talk about the importance of the government. You just have to look at the data that we have just mentioned. It is essential to control the force used by the government. And maybe if the discourse is not enough, we can talk about a reality that is very current in Brazil today. After the, the rise of the the black lives matter all over the globe with the death of george floyd we have the killing of john john pedro and the black movement that has always been fighting has reinforced its uh, uh anger regarding the the action of authorities and claiming for uh measures to that we have through Connecta, we have participated in this litigations in many actions in Brazil, organizations that had never had access to the federal system, like the Hedges of uh, Maré, Coletivo Papo Reto, and many other initiatives claiming for memory and global justice. Many local organizations uh, demanded from the Supreme Court the pressure against black deaths by the government so they use the rule of law to challenge and demand from the government uh, some action and the supreme court recognized the control and the interruption of uh, political operations during the pandemic in the communities and what the results we had we had 70 percent reduction of violent deaths do you want a more classic example of how important it is to control force uh, used by police forces? Regarding this argument, no, there's no legitimacy to that uh, combat. It is the criminality in Brazil, uh, the fight against it is racist. There's a racist combat that uh, rules the policy against drugs it is racist because it's focused on black bodies the way uh the politic the politics against uh drugs reinforces racism uh reinforces negro policies uh it were it is uh pressed on the communities that benefits economic structure based on the traffic of arms on the traffic of drugs and they not fulfill the promises that the so society makes as long as you have people using drugs and you have that use in all different social classes you will have the traffic of uh, the drug traffic and that's the reality it is impossible to end. So why do we choose this form in, uh, of war against drugs? Because it benefits some uh, sectors of the society, from those who make more money with the illegal commerce and those who benefit from this economic model. So for task number one, I'm sorry if I've talked too much, we can start by being re the rationale of the state through elementary aspects, control of force and change in the politics that create forms of violence that we can that are unacceptable. And this is on the base under the control of the public forces. So there is a control of the force of uh, the police forces is essential, changing radically the legislation that criminalizes in an inconceivable manner the, the model of uh, fight against drugs in our country. This policies and the way the legislation is structured uh, stimulates violence. It causes 
black people, which sometimes use or sometimes are uh, responsible for smaller tasks in drug commerce, are the more representative part of the prison uh, model in that area. Not even the basic guarantees of our ben, uh, prison system are applied to this population, and they should be. So we do need today of an attitude that is more radical regarding our institutions because they are today do not fulfill the role the rule of law uh, applied to them they are leaving the contradiction that was uh, experienced by the revolutionary in france trying to sustain an ideological model of universality and rationalism that do not apply to the black population. Hello. I think I, I fell for a minute. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, Gabriel, thank you very much for your observations. You mentioned a lot how we need to control the use of force by the police uh, forces in our society. And thinking of this last part of your speech, you talked about how we need to adopt a more radical attitude regarding our institutions. So I want to talk, ask you, Emma, you have a phrase that is a title of one of your works that is very well known, and it says a lot about the movements, uh, how the black movements have been organizing to fight racism for centuries in Brazil. Our steps come from afar. We have the late of quotas, uh, the CAO law, and the recognition of Quilombola lands. And these were advances uh, that we had thanks to the movement, a uh, black movement in Brazil, and with people organizing many different spaces and different mo times. And I want you to talk about how these movements are important and how the civil society is important in uh, reporting racism. Good afternoon. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And using Tiago's suggestion, I'm going to describe myself. I am a black woman. I was born in the 1960s. So uh, understand that the marks of this time is in my body and my the way I look. So I use dreadlocks. I wear glasses uh, with a black frame. And, and there is a, a, a side of my glasses that are green and bluish, and I'm wearing a color and the salmon shirt. I have books behind me on a shelf, and I also have uh, black dolls on that same shelf. So I salute Tiago, Gabriel, Barbara, and everyone, and everyone involved in this conference, everyone that is here with us. I would like to thank the team uh, that is part of Educa Libras, uh, disseminating our message further to other people. So responding to your question concerning the civil society role on activism, what we have built so far and what else do we have to do, uh, achieve to, to reach justice and dignity in life? I need to say that the civil society is the humanity. It's ourselves. It's people. And why am I saying this? We cannot forget that when we are talking about structure and institutions and society, we are talking about people and their choices, the choices they make individually and collectively. We are talking about the interactions of everyone towards existence. It's humankind. The instances of existence, the birds and the plants, it's 
ourselves and everything all together and diversity of human people. It's us. So what is our role and what is our important and our responsibility? We need to put ourselves in our own place and fulfill our duties. What am I moved by? I am moved by the belief just about the way uh, Caetano says, people are made to shine, not to die of hunger. But in the basis, there is a drive of mankind that is proactive towards the existence. But there is also some other drives. The, the drive that is generating death, we are talking about people in a collective way. We're talking about us. We are living through times and within the black experience in our century and centuries in which this drive, this wish and this interest, uh, this destructive drive has been in place and strong. But before that, there were only us who wanted to live and wanted to do our things. So in this long journey of production of death and destruction with the colonialism and slavery and racism in what is imposed by this all to humankind for the, to those who have dark skin, this death, pain and destruction production, which is just part of, the, of what the black people experiment at the same time, when we are uh, in movement towards life, we are facing these problems. Before the colonial invasion in Africa, we were already there as human beings. We were there as humankind. If you remember the numbers, they say that humankind started there. And we, we were there already saying what we wanted to say, but then we received violence and death and pain. What has been our role since then? It's been this, dona this radical donation. It's, it's the paradox between life and death. Uh, this invasion did not find a, a passive, pacific po people. They found reaction, and this reaction has been happening since then. We need to understand this. There are different dimensions. There is one part that uh, addresses extreme violence and racism, invasion, but there is also the reaction that brings oh, of discourse. We were announcing our society. We received invasors and then we raise our voice and we say, no, we are not this. We are still what we were and what we wanted to be. We need to oppose this fight. We need to fight this. Why I'm saying this in a very generic perspective, because this is what civil society is. This opposition on annihilation to, uh, against life. What is our role in this? We need to put ourselves in our own place. I need to put myself in my own place. And what is that? And what is my place? And what is your place as white? It doesn't matter what color you are. We need to remember that the society, the civil society is what builds the structure. Uh, uh, the civil society builds the structure and the society. They are going to benefit from it or be harmed by it. We need to put ourselves in our roles and look at this structure, look at this structure of structural racism. And you, we need to deauthorize it every time, all the time. We have to disagree, You're not looking at this from afar, not from an observatory and saying, oh, well, the government should do this, oh, the judiciary should do this, and oh, the school, and oh, well, the school should do this and that. This is not what we are supposed to do. We need to look at what people are doing in and out. This is the power of the, the people have authorizing or deauthorizing violence and authorizing and deauthorizing this uh, racist annihilation and this power that there is. 
that is given to some people and I, re I just remind and I just remember this the white people has appropriated themselves from this power it is important that the white people start acting in their own place they have to start deauthorizing this institutionality they have to deauthorize uh, through the law through institutions through processes it is important that we need to break from a few things. Well, of course, there's Sueli Carrera, and she's one of the most important activists. And she, Sueli Carrera likes saying, and cite Charles Mills, we need to tear the racial contract. This is the civil society putting itself in its role place. And they have to this comfortable seat in which they say, "Well, this is not it's not my problem." You see, people uh, 50 saying that they didn't understand racism. Well, they understood it. They have always understood, but they've stood and said that they don't just now. But they 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 were racist then until then. And where Tiago is in that place, where Gabriel is, and where Barbara is, where we all are. We put ourselves there, and we have to thank for this work. We have deauthorized that contract that would beneficiate that 50-year-old white man and who saw violence and annihilation and exclusion through all his life. We've just deauthorized this person of being in a very comfort position of thinking that nothing is happening. But thank God, and it's just a way of saying that. Lazaro Ramos, thank God, has written a book that triggered something inside that person and he started tearing up that contract at that moment there are many objects transactional objects all over the scattered all over the world and this is going to be the trigger for each and every one of you but we have to say that our role and our responsibility is radical and just just to use what gabriel said there's no other way we need to stop with this. We need to end one world to build another. And I'm saying that as a black woman, all the time we need to destroy the disannihilation world to create another world in which we can exist. And all black people do this all the time. We need to destroy one world and create another. And that happens all the time for us. And, but then you can say, well, the structure is just so huge. And the, well, the challenge is huge as well. And the responsibility is even larger. The duty and the need is much bigger than everything. There are ways to approach what has to be done. If the path you, if this is the path and you are going to find it in a Lazaro Ramos book, then do it. This bring, um, we have to mention an article of, uh, a lawyer from the civil rights of white people. He's white. Uh, he was, his last name was Black, but he was a white person. When I was a teenager, I uh, remember he, uh, he said that he, when he was a teenager, he loved jazz in the 50s. He was a teenager in the United States and he got to know Louis Armstrong. He knew he found his geniality and he that was a trigger for him he was uh finally visiting a racist world and he found out a genius in his geniality in the figure of a black man and from that moment on that was a trigger that ignited something into him and he he for that reason he he started acting as a lawyer for civil rights and the fight of the black people on the racism in the United States. There are many different ways, but you, everyone has to go through this. The, my, ourselves, the black population, we've been doing this work for quite a long time now. There were many moments in which the white population um, adhered to it. I am giving you an example of uh, Mr. Black, uh, a white, person fighting for for black people and i've learned this and of course i've learned it the hard way with sueli carneiro 
for several years now, maybe in 1999 to 2000, we were uh, acting in the process of the World Conference Against Racism uh, with ONU in 2000. And Jose Carnero called out for a meeting we were in that meeting, there were black and white people, activists, and then she said, remember, talking about racism, black people talk and the white people stay quiet. They just sit as someone interested. Sueli Carneiro said to the white people, and, and she also said, she said that to us as well, you have to do something. There's no anti-racism if you don't participate because you need to tear up this contract the racial, racial contrast. It's just to say that this whole of the civil society has a role to play. Uh, if you remember Greta Thunberg, the house is on fire, she said. The world is a house and the house is on fire. The, the world is the house, it is on fire, and inside the house we are all sick, not only because of the pandemics, but we are sick and we are challenged towards such fragility to rebuild the house, to heal the pain and live again. It's within the radicality. We have to be radicals. It's life against death. So it has to be radical. There's no other way because this is how it's going to go against everything and everyone. Black people who were descending uh, from the one who were uh, for, uh, kidnapped and uh, used, we are taking having this conversation from this standpoint. But ha you have to remember, no one is safe. You remember Jean Alberto? You saw the black producer in France being brutally uh, killed by P by the police in France. But we only saw that that at that isolated moment where it happens all the time you need to see it and understand and you need to act and we have to act now because in opposition to that we are going to have death that's it thank you Jirema. i'll take the opportunity and describe myself i'm a black woman with long hair curly hair i'm dressed in black I'm ha wearing glasses with transparent flames, and uh, I want to continue talking and take the opportunity, Jerema, using your speech. You had a very important, all of you have a very important role in localizing the fight against racism in the, the contract context of uh, the society. A lot of people use this concept in to say, oh, it's structural racism, there's nothing I can do about it. So I think it's very important that you, uh, we ha we're having technical problems here. I think we lost our speaker. Feedback. So we have to build new worlds and new scenarios. We're living in a crisis in Brazil. The country is facing very uh, backstabs in politics with black women, trans people, indigenous people making great efforts to change it. Uh, promoting their uh, political actions and being elected with radical uh, as radical candidates. And so I wanted to bring to the panel a question on what do you think, how are these people, uh, how important are these people who are taking uh, these positions and taking this role of building new realities for people in Brazil? It was a question to all of you, whoever wants to start, general uh, question. I can talk a little bit. I think what we've seen, it's a break in the political system. 
like that little opening that opens to for a light to come in for new oxygen to come in to that in a place this is the metaphor i see it's an opening and a crack because it breaks paradigms it breaks uh glass ceilings like many black women who have been elected in places where you didn't have any elected black people so you have some people like erica hilton who is a black trans woman with most voted for that specific representative uh, chamber. So she's opening the ceiling so you can have let a new air come in. Of course, we're way below what we need for a revolution in that political space. But it's interesting when you talk about radicality, and I, I'm glad you didn't have brought that. That says a lot about our society when being radical is proposing something like Black Lives Matter or things like the political power being more uh, closer to the society represents. So it says a lot about our society when you see how far we are from solving those issues or being interested in these issues. When you consider that being radical, this should be the minimum uh, standard for uh, living. More life, less death, more representative in those spaces, representativeness in that space. So it is not that uh, I like to, when people say, well, now you have black people in the in policy, trans people in policy. Our daily life is doing policy, uh, politics. Our life is creating uh, survival links, survival bonds, fighting against oppression, thinking new uh, worlds like Shurema was mentioning. This is our, the constant exercise of politics. What we're doing now is opening cracks in the political party system and trying to change the scenario and bringing all this life that exists outside uh, politics and bringing it inside. And remembering the feeling I had after the death of uh, Jean Alberto at Carrefour, I woke up extremely tired with that feeling of here we go again, we need to explain again that uh, racism exists and we have to start explaining all over again. And this in this feeling is of tiredness has to do a lot with this lack of oxygen, of the lack uh, of oxygen in the debates in the uh, judicial and the political system. And that's why we need more black people in these spaces, more trans people in these spaces, so we can exactly get new perspectives, new views of the world, new perceptions in these spaces. And we need to understand that structural racism uh, perpetuates exactly because it presents like a very heavy burden something that you can't avoid, a structure that can't be moved. So when I'm talking about a structural racism, it's like a concrete pillar that you cannot move, and it can be moved. Uh, it, it is not indestructible. So when you think, have this view of racism, we need to break this view. It is fragile, it is not unavailable, and life does win over death if we allow oxygen to get to these political spaces. So this starts causing us to, allowing us to breathe a little deeper in this scenario that it were so hard to breathe. Go ahead, uh, Zayama. I just wanted to add uh, something uh, to these people who have just been elected. Remind you that supporters of Erika Hilton during uh, the campaign were suffered aggression, were attacked on the streets. Reminding you that Ana Lucia Martins was elected uh, city representative in Joinville. She received, uh, is receiving death threats. Uh, state representative uh, elected in the 
in the majority election in 2018, Ilya Petroni, she has need to file a protection measure because she suffers threats since she was a city representative with the highest number of voters when she was elected. And remember that Maria Le Franco was killed. Uh, it will be a thousand days since Maria Le was killed and up to now we have no idea who had her killed. So why am I saying all that? I want to say two things. First, to get to this moment where you have uh, Marielle and all these people elected, this is the result of uh, civil mobiliz mobilization, not the parties. The parties didn't even support these candidates. They uh, surpassed their structures. The parties did not support, though there is a judicial uh, decision saying that there should be equality, at least in the distribution of uh, the parties. The right and the left are on the hands of old, white, cis people. And these parties also worked against these uh, black candidates. There was a, a, the LGBT and trans uh, women uh, movement is ever more active the movement of black people, of Kilimbala, all these groups that have opened this crack, opened it on their own. This talks about their power, but talks about the risks. Uh, the situation of Ana Lucia and Lilian, for example, talk about the power, or Erika Hilton, for example, talk about the power, but mention the risks. I'm calling the attention to that because what can help protect these people is the fight. Uh, uh, the, the situation uh, that surrounds us, be it the chamber of legislatures, the mayor's office, the, the, the global representatives, the federal government, they all maintain their racist pact. They all maintain the uh, a ra a racism that is patriarchal, that excludes a lot of people. I saw Rodrigo Neves, he's a, a white uh, man with disabilities from this, all, among all that, they only elected two people with disabilities. We have a very long path ahead of us of breaking and making, the, uh, causing this pact to be broken. This racism in the left and in the right uh, that we see in all levels of the government and which is in power in Brazil. It is a supremacist uh, uh, movement that is still well organized and it's radical, becoming radical due to our radicality. So we have to be prepared to protect the life and the fight of these people. Certainly. Jirema, this is a very important reminder of how these people who are elected, these women and trans people, are also vulnerable to political violence. Instituto Maria de Franco has just released the research on that, and the results are uh, not surprising but terrifying, and because we did expect this kind of reaction. Now we have a question for Gabriel that comes from the organizing team of the conference. When you commented the killing of Jean Alberto, they also denied the existence of racism in Brazil. Remembering that the current director of uh, Palmares organization, what's the impact of this ne uh, negationism coming from this into uh, these institutions? I want to thank you for the question, and I just want to mention something about the previous question. There are several dimensions to power and several types of fight to change uh, the structure of power. And Black women have been essential in the various dimensions, especially in the, on the base of the society in the fight for the right of, to life. And through Connectors, I've had the experience to experience how much these women are in the vanguard of the fight against institutional violence uh, 
in addition to all the examples mentioned by Jurema that I second in face of the importance they have in the political fights, I also want to reinforce the importance of the, the, of, uh, the May mothers who have been fighting since 2016 against the genocide of the political forces, the political forces here in Brazil. Many, so many black women that overcome the pain of the death of their children to be in the forefront of the fight for hum, human rights in Brazil. So this example is essential and it's essential for us men to acknowledge the chauvinism that prevents after so many time uh, uh, such a, a proper representation of these women in the other spaces where we fight for power. So it's always our role to challenge and uh, question what we have been doing so these spaces are also occupied by women in uh, the House of Representatives and other spaces where they are essential for changes in our society. So regarding this uh, discourse of these authorities, it just shows how uh, they are lacking in terms of the current, the moment we are experiencing. Uh, just mention the behavior of this person who is, uh, how our current president has been behaving and regarding human rights since uh, before he was present. I, we can only be sorry for that, but we, ha we can demand from them, exercise a role uh, in building uh, and fighting uh, for a new society, showing racism. They do not acknowledge or deny racism because they are racist and, and they reproduce that in their behavior because there is no fight of the society against this killing force. Uh, what is the uh, public security and safety policy they defend? It's, we're not talking about data from the United States or France. I'm not getting into their data. I'm talking about the data here in Brazil, the, the country that they are, they have been elected to rule. What have they been doing to fight against the 80% of violent killings of that people? Uh, and apart from uh, everything that everyone said and what they said and being racist at the greatest degree possible and the racism that would move the agreement to the act of people who violated the rights of black people when slavery was forbidden but still done we are being compared to people like this because apart from being racist those people are incompetent towards what they do to fight these data that are here if they don't see the race factor if these they should see the importance of their work then towards uh, building a better society and being responsible as public agents and they should challenge at different dimensions that the private private spheres act differently because the case of João Alberto also puts on the table models of society that we see and what the companies are preaching as company policy and how to deal with the disturbance of order in their businesses because we see that in private sec in the private sector and uh, uh, environments of uh, reproduction of economy it is impossible that we allow people to be approached in the way they in the way he was people should not behave that, that way towards a human life. So if one authority is just unable to see their own responsibilities as a public agent and towards this situation, if the, the authority is unable to see the model of society we live in and how to challenge and demand another behavior from the companies then that they should behave differently in our country. The voice we were expecting was uh, then 
indignation and the charge and responsibility, a voice that in a sovereign way would address this with urgency, with sense of responsibility. This is what we see and they are responsible for our security and they should demand something different. Those in power should demand a different approach and a different behavior from society and the responsibility of those who are consuming should not be above the lives of black people. They should not allow in any aspect that this per a person would be treated like this because this is what we see. What we see is the supposedly tranquility but if there is a black body there disturbing uh, disturbing and uh, going on your way of and not allowing you to profit for some reason this is a level in of, of social structural racism that we see and this is a com a way we can take the liability we see people taking uh, removing the liability of uh, companies because it's easy to see it's the, their their behavior is just easy they don't have they have the legitimacy to to rule the country but they see the structural racism as a shield not to act and this is not about it all the contribution about what social uh, racial structural racism is and this is how this is just so wrong the way they reproduce economy it's just incompatible to human rights they need to be liable for this and we need at a national level at world level we need to change this the company is in this country and uh, their headquarters is in Paris in, in France so we do not accept that people who rule these brands are still there reproducing this sort of behavior the answers have been insufficient until now and I'm still ashamed that this company is still acting in our country and using the social racism and structural racism as a shield. They need to be liable. And they, because they are not liable, they keep on acting like this. And it's important for us to question the way they stand it's important that we ourselves as individuals, how much are you willing to put of ourselves in the fight against racism? The way Judima said, it's about life and death. Some of them are contributing to death and some can commit, uh, they can commit a space of their lives towards the fight against racism in different spheres in our society. Thank you, Gabriel. Your, your speech was really important so that we can think of the spaces uh, that the institutions we uh, know uh, play their role. Let's just answer one of the questions from the public and it's a question to Jurema. The question mentions that this uh, international amnesty uses letters and talks to governments, but also run campaigns. We see Black Lives Matter, for example. And the question uh, from Gabriela Furtado to Jurema is, what do you believe is the best strategy uh, on an institutional level to protect and promote the rights of black people? I think this is a very difficult question. It's hard to address and to point out one or two actions. I think that the best strategy is to engage in the fight. There are many, many uh, causes and fights available for you to join. 
Gabriela mentioned the many ways the amnesties the amnesty acts and this is one example and i'm going to use my space just to, to mention one example we've just launched on friday a campaign that was going to launch uh on the 20th of november we had to in, interrupt the agenda to to address the situation with Carrefour and the racist actions that were taken there. So we've delayed their campaign one week and the campaign is called Every Friday is Black. And this campaign is from the Anestet Guguj with Sedempa and Konap and Olodum. This campaign is about uh, moving people to every Friday call people and offer opportunity of people to engage in the fight against racism in Brazil. If you don't know, there is a website, Every Friday is Black. In Portuguese, Toda Sexta é Black. Uh, we launched it on Black Friday, just to say that the path is through engagement. What happened in, in the south of Brazil was just another story. Uh, justice is not uh, a consumption product. Justice is the result of a fight and engagement. So we have this campaign. It's a movement. It's going to happen all the way until the 20th of November next year. We expect to have other organizations to join this movement, producing content and opportunities of engagement every Friday because every Friday is Black is a Black Awareness Day. Every Friday is considered a Black Awareness Day. This could be done in several different ways, but I would like to emphasize that we, the best strategy is doing, is acting. Because silencing or just to contemplate won't do any good. I'm an activist. I started activism when I was eight and Brazil was in a dictatorship. And I started a school movement as a child, but I was considering a moral and civic education and all the dictatorship way of doing things. Although I have started that during the dictatorship, there was this parallel of, a, of, of more useful information and more important that ended up contributing to my engagement in the fight against racism. That is, information is there, things are there, and although it sounds and feels difficult, I was during dictatorship, you see, uh, there were people were silenced then, remember? At the same time, information is in every sphere and everywhere. We'd better engage than just sit and wait for something to happen. Right now, I'm going to ask one last question because we're just about uh, ending, we don't, don't have a lot of minutes. We have one question to Tiago. Has to do a lot with what Jurema said. The question came from the public. It's, a, it's about bringing this fight to another sphere and engaging people. Question from Ana Palocelli. How, and thinking of qualifying, the increasing of the qualified debate in Brazil, and with your experience as a professor, how can we promote anti-racist ideas at schools and universities? I think it, uh, that depending on where we are, whether it's a university or a school, uh, mid-school, elementary school, high school, we have this need of understanding history, Brazilian history better, from this perspective of anti-racism and not including only slavery, but also the fights and that have happened throughout this century. We see, for example, initiatives that are interesting from Nexus Journal that discloses content for schools with themes such as racism and other themes. We also see a great movement in the editorial market that is leveraged by black people like Jamila Ribeiro, 
publishing books that are accessible to population and with a cheap price uh, with the collection of plural feminism, for example, that deals with the race, with racism at different perspectives. In at universities, it's important to understand that when we talk about racism, we are all talking about something. It's not a side theme. It is not only something that's going to be discussed in 30 minutes. It's not that. Or sometimes we have courses of five years, for example, at law school, but that's not just enough. When I was a student, I only, we, we just had a few discussions on that. We need to put the racial, racist discussion at every sphere. When we're talking, uh, when we're studying medicine, you can study this. We can address uh, the black population. When we talk about the Brazilian health system, we have to include that in that agenda. There are so many aspects that can be uh, used as an opportunity for discussion. And law, for example, the way our cities are structured, engineering and urban communities, these are all questions that could include the racist um, issue in reading more black authors, understanding more of the history, uh, giving opportunity for black people to express themselves and see how uh, the racism is placed in your area of, of expertise. It's going to be hard to find an area that does not include this perspective. We need to have it across discussed. That's for sure. I work in... Uh, and a project that includes black women and technology. We thought this was an area that was free of this debate, but thinking of gender and racism is important. We need to think of the world we are creating. I'm going to use the opportunity and we are heading towards the end. I would like to ask every one of you to make uh, your final considerations. And I would also like to ask you to indicate any books or documentaries that you think that would be relevant and transforming and things that the audience could consume to get to know more of this theme. Okay. I'll point uh, to Zurema then. Uh, Okay, thank you. I think there's a lot of inspiring material. One of the things that inspires me a lot, I don't know about you, but listening to the Samba for the Samba schools uh, for 2020, they talked about the indigenous fights, they talked about black women, the fight of the black population, they talked about the, the power of tradition. I was uh, thinking about these symbols uh, because to say that much of what we've learned about the fight as the black population, before getting to the books, there were other platforms to using a, a language that is closer to you, to technology. There were other platforms. Serge Hall says we worked on ourselves as screens for representation. What inspires is educating our, our perspective, educating our ears, educating the way we uh, put ourselves in the world. And in the back uh, here in my bookcase, you see many uh, literature books by Conceição Evaristo. She's, she narrates a world that needs to disappear. And she uh, talks about it because she always uses the voice of the women. And I think her work, it's a good and inspiring opportunity to see that while they are talking about death and pain, they are the speakers. 
they are not uh, telling their stories to complain, but to tell you that you need to do something because this world needs to disappear. And uh, the, uh, the, for the rest, I want to thank for the opportunity, for all the support, for the great opportunity to be here with Gabriel and Thiago and Barbara. They are very important people in the fight. They do very important stuff. Some I follow closer. As, uh, Mina's program on, is something that I follow from afar because it's not exactly what I do, but I always tell, uh, focus on these people because that's important. I think it's a privilege uh, being here, I thank the organization of the conference for the opportunity. I congratulate you guys for maintaining this agenda this way, because this is the time. It's for Brazil. It's thinking about Brazil. It is all about Brazil. And if you don't think uh, about it from the perspective of creating racial justice, we will we'll not have a country. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Jurema. I'm going to pass the floor on to Gabriel. Well, I want to thank for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here next to Zurema, Werneck, Thiago Ampoero, people I really admire, greatly admire for all they've done uh, during this fight. Barbara, thank you very much to you and all the team, Felipe, Vivian, who invited me, Educalibris, and uh, Edson and Elisa, who have to taken our message to more people. I think what I could leave as final words is a little bit of what I already said in one of my speeches, the importance of each person who is fighting for a better world to have in their agenda the anti-racist fight. How are, much are each one of us uh, willing to give from their face for a fire on their life for a fight for a, not a society that is not racist. We need to change the structure of the society. And for that, we need everybody. Everybody who feels uh, in, in unhappy or uh, indignant regarding the, what they see in their high, their, their society. A society where specific bodies are chosen to be killed in the position of the governor, the, the governance who we uh, elect and who promote racist factors in our society. So there are many fronts in, with which you can engage. The collective ways, uh, the collective actions are the one that change, ones that change the world. What would a debate in the world, anti-racist debate uh, exist in the world without it. So I will tell you here, I present to you a little bit of the, the revolution in Haiti uh, when they fought against the French Revolution and told Napoleon, we here want to and deserve to be free. We do not accept to be uh, an enslaved people. This work teaches a lot on how collective fight is responsible for the transformations on our society. So going to the culture area, I love the Jurema's indications, but today is the anniversary of death of Cartola, one of the most important musicians in Brazil, that show how the voices of uh, the slums teach uh, the song, teach samba. So I will tell you, uh, lo listen to Cartola, uh, watch the movie Quilombo that tells the story of uh, Zumbi do Palmares, Sueli Carneiro, an intellectual that talks about necropolitics, Achille Membe, who is also mentioned, was also mentioned by Thiago Amparo, and it also deals with institutional uh, violence and is very important for our debate today. So that's it. I want to 
leave you the invitation to a fight. It is an urgent fight because it has to do with life and death and death has been chosen. So that we can, let's challenge our society and act as a collective to change the state of things. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thiago? I really want to thank you. Uh, it's great to be here next to people that I really admire. Thank you, Barbara, for moderating this panel. And regarding tips, I think of two books, one that has just come out, a collection of texts by the black feminist writer, Lelia Gonzalez. Uh, she, there's a new collection of uh, texts by her because it's a good, very good one because we didn't have a collection of all her texts in a single uh, book. So if you want to know one of the great writers, Angela Davis, when she was here, uh, said, why are you listening to me if you have Lelia Gonzalez? So this is very important. In literature, there's a writer I like a lot, Eliana Alves Cruz. She writes, she wrote Agua de Barrela uh, and several other books that are very interesting uh, that look at a perspective, uh, historic perspective, but she also talks about the black perspective in this history. So I think this is very important. Something like Tennessee Colts, uh, The Dance of Waters, which is a very beautiful book. And and since you forced me to think of uh, music bringing samba, both Surema and Gabriel mentioned it, maybe the th main reference I really like is Emcida, especially in the fantastic poetry of his last album, which is absolutely beautiful. And I think it points a little bit to what we are talking about regarding thinking of a new world, he also wanted to compose a book and song that were also about love and about thinking of a new world. So we also need that so we can breathe. So thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Thiago, for all the indications. Jurema and Thiago, too. It was great to be all here. I'll leave you two indications. One is the book that just won Jaguti a book that is very uh, moving, very emotional. It follows the rural community after the end of slavery, and it shows our uh, how the slavery and racist uh, thoughts uh, remain persist, and I recommend this book to everybody. And the this one by Octavia Butler that is a lot about thinking of new futures. It's a, a very, we're living in a very hard year, but we have many ideas and new possibilities. I want to thank everybody who followed the debate up to now. From what I hear from the team, it generated a lot of debates, a lot of people commenting. I want to thank Jurema Thiago and Gabriel again and all the organizers of the Conference Pour le Brésil. Thank you very much. And the next debate will be about uh, black activism with great speakers. So I'll leave you the invitation. <laughs>